Good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's forum on uh, the 53rd uh, Congressional District seat. My name is Jeannie Brown. I'm with the League of Women Voters. I'll be the moderator for tonight. So even though we miss you in person, um, we are still reaching more people via Zoom. And all of you at home don't have to uh, comb your hair or get all dressed up or anything. Um, so hopefully um, we will be getting a lot of good information tonight. The League is proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. Our Voters Edge website is, on, is an online resource for you to get more information about these candidates and others, ballot issues, and detailed voting information. So I um, suggest all of you try votersedge.org and to get information before you, before you vote. And I hope that both of these tonight's candidates have put their information on it. So the League moderates candidates forms using a format that's fair and informative. We've asked the candidates to keep to the issues of the, posi of the uh, position rather than personal attacks because our, our, our goal is for voters to be able to learn more about the candidates than they get from campaign ads. We are recording this forum and you'll be able to find it on our league website. We have asked uh, attendees to submit questions online beforehand and we've gotten a, a great uh, selection of, of uh, wonderful uh, questions that we will begin with. If you, um, if you find some questions that we don't ask, be sure to put them in the, the chat and remember to use civility and respect and word them in a general way so it would apply to both candidates. And we have screened the questions beforehand and to make sure um, that there's no duplication and the topics of greatest interest are covered. So our question screeners from the league are Jane Andrews and Wanda Rogers. And from the uh, Bankers Hill uh, group, community group is Nancy Moore. And I wanna thank Bankers Hill group for um, co-hosting this with us. Our timekeeper is Scarlett Lopez and we should adjourn by eight o'clock. With that said, I want to thank you all for joining us on the Zoom webinar to become a more informed voter. So this forum is for the office of, of the 53rd Congressional District. We have two candidates vying for them, Georgette Gomez and Sarah Jacobs. The candidates will have two minutes for their opening statement, two minutes for their closing, and one minute to respond to each question from the audience. We will alternate who answers each question first, and I'll repeat the question if needed for each candidate. Um, we will start alphabetically. Um, and so we will start with um, Georgette Gomez. And Georgette, are you ready for your opening statement? Yes, Jean, I am ready. So I'll go ahead and start. Yes, go Good ahead. Good evening, everyone. Okay, good evening everyone, I'm Georgia Gomez and I'm the first LGBTQ Latina serving as president of the San Diego City Council and I'm running for Congress to stand up to Trump's dangerous agenda and to put the needs of working families first and also to keep delivering results for San Diegans. As president of the San Diego City Council, I work to expand affordable housing and to strengthen protections for low income renters I led the implementation of the city's climate action plan. I had delivered millions of new funding for community projects. I have delivered results for our community and I will bring this type of leadership to Congress, fighting for actions on our climate change, universal health care, criminal justice reform, gun violence prevention, and economic opportunity for all. As we face an economic and a public health crisis, that is being worsened by climate change, I will put people first. Early during this crisis, I listened to experts and took immediate action to help working families in San Diego. Now, as we suffer through an economic recession, recovery will require bold investments with people. As your Congresswoman, 
I plan to be a strong advocate for greater investment in public health, for bold investment to fight the climate crisis, and for actions to, for struggling families, and also to help small businesses that are the foundation of our economy. I also remain committed fighting discrimination in all forms, including past legislation that requires companies to women and people of color the same as white men for the same work. Thank you for inviting me and I look forward to tonight's conversation. Thank you, Georgia. And now Sarah for your opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Jeannie, for moderating. Thank you to the Bankers Hill Community Group and the League of Women Voters for hosting. I'm coming to you uh, here from my apartment in Bankers Hill, so it's really nice to be with my neighbors. And I know I've met and talked with so many of you over the course of this campaign, but for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Sarah Jacobs. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a third generation San Diegan, born and raised went to local public schools, and I was proud to serve my country at the State Department during the Obama administration, where I worked on conflict prevention and response, uh, at UNICEF, where I worked on how we could better serve vulnerable children around the world, as the CEO of Project Connect, an international education nonprofit that's working to connect schools around the world to the internet, and as a policy advisor for Hillary Clinton on the 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, for the last two years or so, I founded and serve as the chair of San Diego for Every Child, a coalition to address childhood poverty here in San Diego. And when COVID hit, uh, we immediately uh, mobilized and helped mobilize over $55 million for uh, child care for essential workers and equitable distance learning through the San Diego COVID-19 Children's Fund that we run. And I believe we need a new generation of leaders who will look at old problems from a new lens, will look at new problems that frankly Congress isn't really addressing, and we'll do things differently. We'll find ways to respect everybody and listen to everybody and work across the aisle to actually get things done. Because for families here in San Diego, partisan gridlock is not just an abstract concept. It affects the assistance that we get. It affects the progress that we get. I'm ready to hit the ground running on day one. So thank you again for having us here today. I'm looking forward to your questions and I would be very honored to earn your support. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so now it's time for the candidates to answer the audience's questions and they'll have one minute for each answer. We'll start with Sarah. So the first question, what do you think is the biggest issue for the 53rd Congressional District and how would you address it? It's a good question. And in the primary, I spent a lot of time talking about the high cost of living for families here in San Diego, including housing and child care uh, and other priorities like gun violence prevention and climate change. Um, but I'll be honest, I think the next Congress is going to be almost entirely focused on COVID-19 relief and getting us out of the current economic and public health crisis that we find ourselves in. And so I will be focused on making sure that that federal recovery assistance gets to those who need it most, to our small businesses and our workers, to families, especially by making sure that families get the childcare that they need to make it through this time, and to make sure that our stimulus packages uh, address our other priorities, make sure that stimulus package address our housing crisis here in San Diego, address the climate change that we know is real, um, and make sure that we're doing everything we can to recover from this crisis and build the future that we all deserve. Thank you, Sarah. And Georgia, what do you think is the biggest issue facing us? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I mean, we can't ignore that we're right now living through one of the major crises, which is, has been uh, broad because of COVID and impacting our economy. But we also have to recognize that in our region, uh, the highest cases that we're seeing are in the South Bay, um, happens to be part of the 53rd. Um, one of the biggest hospitals that is dealing with these cases is also in the South Bay. So definitely recognizing what the impacts currently are by looking beyond and making sure that Congress moves forward with a relief package that would really get to the people that are getting impacted significantly because of COVID, because they lost their jobs, making sure that they're getting, they're getting that support, making sure that PPE is delivered to the South Bay. And then once we move forward beyond that is the economic crisis. Uh, there's a lot of income inequality in South Bay. We need to make sure that we're creating 
uh, better jobs that are increasing the middle income, which right now is impacting quality of life. Thank you. All right, and so um, second question, Susan Davis has been our representative to the House for 20 years and has earned seniority on various committees. As a junior representative in a House of 435 members, what will, you, what will that loss of seniority mean for us as constituents and how well um, will you work to address that, Georgette? Yeah, I mean, we've got to recognize that first need to recognize Susan Davis and for her incredible work that she has put uh, to really represent our community in DC. So I want to thank her for her work. I mean, yes, 20 years is a lot. It's a lot of years and a lot of work that she was able to earn the support of her colleagues to get uh, to get chairmanship um, on different uh, committees. Uh, which is very critical. So I'm going to look forward to our current delegation to be able to get that support. And I'm very proud that we've been able to get support from members of the Hispanic Caucus, of the Equality Caucus, as well as the Progressive Caucus. And I'm going to look to them beyond our own leadership to truly get guidance and support to ensure that, that I'm building the relationships quickly, but also making sure that I'm representing the community in a fast manner. Okay, thank you. And Sarah, how would you address that loss of seniority? Yeah, look, Susan Davis is has long been a mentor and friend of mine. And honestly, one of the reasons I'm running is because we will be losing 20 years of her seniority. And that's why I think it's incredibly important that we elect someone who has the kind of experience that I have working in the federal government, working at the State Department, working for Secretary Hillary Clinton directly with members of Congress on what kinds of legislative packages we were going to introduce in her transition time had she won. Um, and I also think that we've seen what's possible when freshman members of Congress actually have policy expertise. I'm very proud to be endorsed by Congresswoman Katie Porter, who is exactly the kind of freshman that I intend to be, who is able to get things done for her community because she has that experience. We've We've also seen freshman members, especially with foreign policy backgrounds, be able to push for things like a war powers resolution on Iran because they knew how much was at stake and they had that policy background to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Now the third question, we'll start with Sarah. What do you think has been your greatest accomplishment in life, political or otherwise, and what was your role in that achievement? My goodness, that's like a very big um, existential question. Um, but one thing that I'm very proud of is San Diego for every child. Um, about two years ago, I uh, was talking to community members and, and working with community groups and uh, saw that San Diego had a huge issue with childhood poverty. About before this crisis, about 40% of our kids lived in families experiencing poverty. And in a county as wealthy as San Diego, I thought that was simply unacceptable. So I founded a nonprofit initiative uh, called San Diego for Every Child that works with a coalition of groups to end the experience of childhood poverty in San Diego um, that makes sure that we are changing the way that San Diego addresses childhood poverty. And then when we learned that COVID was going to be uniquely affecting children, set up the San Diego COVID-19 Children's Fund and has helped make sure that essential workers get the childcare that they need and that San Diego students are getting as equitable a distance learning as possible. Thank you. And Georgette, what do you think has been your greatest achievement, accomplishment? I've been elected as the council member for District 9 uh, going against uh, the person that was supposed to win and getting outspent three to one, but we were able to succeed because of the power of the community. That was a monumental um, day for the community, for myself, and a really testament in believing that we can let people that are that have been doing the community work for a very long time. Um, and then secondly, becoming the council president. I mean, that was a really big deal to elect this brown uh, Latina uh, to, to lead the council and has been supported unanimously by my colleagues was significantly, but also very proud that not only did I get elected to lead the council once and twi or twice, but also we managed to change the conversation in San Diego. We're talking about police accountability. We're talking about affordable housing. We're talking about equity in this, in this city. So we, I have managed to change the conversation in this city and I'm looking forward to doing the same thing in Congress. Thank you. 
Okay, and for the fourth question, we'll go to Georgette. What specific steps do you think Congress can take to address climate change? Well, there's, there's a lot to say there, <laughs> uh, but let's try it in one minute. I mean, first is we gotta make sure that uh, Congress, uh, that the federal government is committed in adopting the Green New Deal. I think that sets the framework in how we're going to be a leader in acknowledging and what we're gonna do to address the climate crisis. So that's number one. Um, and in order for us to do that, we need to make sure that we're building the political will. Um, and uh, once we do that, I mean, we need to move this country to 100% renewable energy. I'm glad that we were able to do it for the city of San Diego. I'm looking forward in doing that work at the federal level to ensure that we're moving the country that we're, we should be the model on how we're addressing the climate crisis. But in fact, we're still fighting um, and uh, we need to ensure that we're moving forward with the Green New Deal, 100% renewable energy, investing in transit, um, and then influencing other countries and helping them achieve their green uh, house reductions as well. Thank you. And Sarah? Yeah, I'm a millennial. Um, my generation is going to deal with the consequences of uh, these decisions being made or not made longer than anybody else. I would like to have kids one day. I'd like there to be a world for them to live in. So I support a Green New Deal, and I think that we need to get to an entirely clean energy economy by 2030, starting with the most polluting sources of energy first. I think we can do that through huge investments in new green technology. Um, I also think that it's important that as we're talking about any stimulus package, that we're imbuing that stimulus package with our broader climate change goals and not inadvertently locking in high emissions industries that otherwise wouldn't have survived this time. We need to recommit to the Paris Climate Accord. And one thing I'm really excited about for San Diego is making sure we're investing in blue technology and using the ocean for energy generation to be a carbon sink for food production. I think we can really benefit from those investments here in San Diego, both because of our proximity to the ocean and because of our high tech workforce. Thank you. All right, the next question um, will go to Sarah. Given that San Diego is an important border region, what immediate changes to asylum, refugee, and citizenship policy would you advocate for in college, in, in, com in Congress? Um, yeah, like I think that we here in San Diego know how important our immigrant community is to our economy, to our community. And that is something I really want to bring to Congress. So the first thing is, I think we need to pass a Clean Dream Act. Any young person who came here should be allowed to stay and they should not be used as a political football. Second, I think that we need to set a minimum goal of accepting 95,000 refugees a year and stop the Trump administration's policies of asylum metering and the remain in Mexico policy that are incredibly hurtful and frankly, illegal under, under international law. We need to keep families together, have a pathway to citizenship for undocumented residents, make sure businesses can have the workers that they need without abusing the visa system to underpay workers. And we need to make sure that we're bringing our deported veterans home. Anyone who served our country should be allowed to stay here. Thank you. And Georgette, the same question. Should I repeat it? Yeah, no, I'm OK. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, this is a personal one for me. Um, as a daughter of immigrant parents and that lived under a roof where my parents were undocumented, my brother and sister were undocumented, I can tell you that the, the psychological impact, the hurt that it does to one, not knowing if they're gonna come back or because they want to work, if they're gonna come back or be taken away, it's, it's, it's serious. And uh, we really need to ensure that we're doing everything that, that we can to move forward in creating uh, a comprehensive immigration reform, a pathway to citizenship for immigrant, immigrant community members. And I'm gonna be very active in that. Uh, we need to get the DREAM and PROMISE Act across the finish line to give DREAMers a pathway to citizenship. Uh, we need to extend and expand student visas, work visas and asylum applicant applications um, and ensure that uh, we also need to work hard to repeal the Muslim ban. We have uh, deported veterans that are waiting to come back and become citizens. We need to ensure that that also happens. Thank you. All right, and now the next question, we begin with Georgette. What are your ideas about solving and funding 
the sewage problem on the border due to the Tijuana River overflow? Georgia. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I mean, that's definitely been a major issue in our own backyard here, mm -hmm. something that hasn't been, uh, been able to move forward because of the lack of resources. I'm glad that we were able to get some money allocated. Uh, we definitely need more. I think uh, we should fight really hard to actually declare this a super fund to be able to open up an opportunity to get more resources uh, to bring the necessary money that is needed. Um, and we also, I mean, I've been very active in going to Mexico and building the relationships with the government over there. We need to make sure that they too are committed with resources so they're doing their piece on the Mexican side of the, of, of, of the land. Um, one can't work without the other. So we need to build the political uh, commitment from Mexico and I'm gonna work hard in making sure that that happens as well. Thank you. And Sarah? I'm incredibly grateful to our congressional delegation who was able to secure $300 million in funding in the USMCA to address cross-border pollution, including the wastewater pollution in the Tijuana River Valley. We know that for decades, that sewage and trash that has polluted the Tijuana River Valley has also posed a huge health risk to people on both sides of the border. And I was also glad to see the EPA's update last month announcing an MOU with the International Boundary and Water Commission that will increase the treatment of wastewater by 10 million gallons a day. They also announced additional work to capture more of the actual sediment and trash that would otherwise flow into the Pacific Ocean. And this is all incredibly important progress. And I will gladly work with other members of the congressional delegation to ensure we're making progress on this issue. And I think that my background working in international diplomacy in foreign policy understands how we need to make agreements with our foreign counterparts will be incredibly important in moving this forward. Thank you. Okay, the next question. What federal policies and programs will you support to address the growing crisis of hunger and food insecurity in San Diego? And Sarah, go first. This is a huge issue. And as part of San Diego for Every Child, one of uh, the aspects of the experience of childhood poverty that we uh, talk a lot about is uh, food insecurity and uh, hunger. So first of all, I was glad to see that as part of the continuing resolution to keep our government funded, there was also an agreement to expand the SNAP benefits and make sure that this expanded SNAP continues through the, the duration of this crisis. I think it's also important to remember that even before the current economic crisis that we're in, here in San Diego County alone, we had about 39,000 members of military families who had to visit the food bank every single month. So we need to protect the SNAP program, CalFresh here in California. We need to expand the eligibility. And I believe we also need to make sure that we're expanding the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit so that families are getting the assistance that they need from the federal government. And we're doing that on a monthly basis instead of making them wait until the end of the year when it's really just paying off other debt that they've incurred. All right, and Georgia? Yeah, we, I mean, right now we're, we're seeing more people live through poverty, uh, especially because of the pandemic. So we need to make sure that Congress is moving forward and adopting a, a relief package that really addresses the, the fact that we do have a, a, an economic crisis that has impacted and it's leading people to poverty. That's number one but definitely expanding SNAP and I'm glad that it's getting expanded. But once we do that, we also need to ensure that we're loosening the requirements and how to apply it becomes very complicated and folks are not able to apply. So therefore we're leaving money, um, not because the need is not there, but we're actually leaving money on the table um, and, and not allowing people to be qualified into the program. So that has to be addressed. Um, and we really need to address that uh, income inequality in this nation. I mean, those are critical social programs, but at the end of the day, we need to lift people from poverty. And that means creating uh, moderate income jobs. Thank you. All right, and this is a similar question, but slightly different. What concrete steps would you endorse to rectify racial and economic injustice? And Georgette, you go first. Yeah, I think um, we first need to acknowledge that this country has uh, has created racial injustices. 
um, that is very critical. I think we, we are still living under this premise that it's not there, but you talk to uh, indigenous people, you talk to brown people or black people, uh, people of color, and they'll tell you differently. So this country needs to actually acknowledge and recognize our history and the history that it was built upon uh, utilizing people of color and to, to, to really create the country that it is. And once we do that, we need to correct that by ensuring that we're paying people of color uh, equal pay um, and provide uh, a path for better jobs. So they're not having to work minimum wage jobs. Uh, that has to change. Uh, we need to invest in communities of color, uh, build housing that is affordable, that will lead to home ownership. And we also need to address the climate crisis, which is an environmental justice issue. Okay, thank you. And um, Sarah, the same question. Yeah, I've been so proud of all of the young people who have taken to the streets and, and really made sure that the issue of racial justice, uh, that we're having the national reckoning that is long overdue and that we're not letting that issue move out of the headlines. Um, we've, on our campaign, created a series of town halls to use my platform to talk about issues like the school to prison pipeline, how immigration and criminal justice reform intersect. And then I also worked with community leaders to come up with a plan on how we can prioritize racial justice at the federal level, which includes addressing policing, but also understanding that relief policing happens within the broader context of racial injustice. We need a truth and reconciliation process. I support HR 40, uh, a commission to study reparations. We have to address the racial wealth gap, including by targeted programs for communities who are formerly redlined. I'm really excited about a baby bond approach, which was introduced by Senator Cory Booker, which basically gives any kid born in the United States a savings account that they can then use to uh, invest in a home and a business uh, and pay for their education, which will do a lot to close the racial wealth gap. Thank you. All right, and um, the next question, yeah, we'll start with Sarah. You both have said that you would like to see a more equitable world. So what is equitable in the eyes of someone who grew up in poverty and what is equity in the eyes of someone who comes from great wealth? Sarah? Yeah, um, my family got to live the American dream. My grandfather was the first in his family to go to college, and he graduated from college and a master's and a PhD program without any student debt. He worked at a public university, and because of that, he was able to start a business that has fundamentally changed uh San Diego and change the way we communicate. And I'm running um, so that any family and every family has the kinds of opportunities that my family had. And I believe it's my unique responsibility to use the advantages and privileges that I've had to make San Diego and the world fair and to make sure that every kid has those kinds of advantages and opportunities. Um, that's why I started San Diego for Every Child to address childhood poverty here in San Diego. And it's why I worked at UNICEF and the Obama administration because I really believe that that is my responsibility. Thank you. And Georgia? Yeah, I mean, coming from the barrio, uh, low income, uh, I, I, we, we first need to acknowledge that there are inequities in this country, that people of color have been targeted historically. Um, I had to be bussed out of my community to get good quality education. That shouldn't have happened and that shouldn't be happening and still happening to the state. We need to invest in public education in a higher level for communities that have been redlined. And those are black, black and brown communities. We need to ensure as well that we're addressing the ownership gap. Uh, there's less accessibility for brown and black community members to have an opportunity to become an owner if they wish to become a homeowner. Um, you know, we are incarcerating black and brown people the highest. When they get out, uh, we still have a box requirement where you're applying for a job or in a home. You need to check that box. That has to be eliminated. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, Georgette, what changes, it was a totally different topic now, what changes in agricultural policy? Would you support, given that San Diego County and California are major agricultural producers? Uh, I mean, someone that loves, uh, I mean, what's a, a food 
uh, and addressing the food desert is very important. Food desert communities is very important, but what do we do? Uh, we need to incentivize the smaller farm uh, farming um, families. And we have a lot in California, actually. We have a lot in San Diego region. We're one of the highest uh, number regions of having small farms. Uh, we need to make it easy for farmers that are choosing to be uh, pesticide free or organic. We need to be uh, incentivizing them because they're actually uh, minimizing the impact to the climate. So that should be an incentive and there should be a stronger program, which there isn't one right now. It's actually pretty costly to certify a farm. And then we also need to ensure that that product is being delivered to low income communities, desert uh, communities that don't have access to healthy food as well. So they also have the support of adding new customers and that they're, they're keeping up growth. Thank you. And Sarah? So um, my middle sibling is actually a, a farmer. They work on a social justice focused uh, farm that is trying to change the way we do vegetable production to make it more equitable. So, you know, I think the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we're protecting farm workers who frankly have been on the front lines of COVID um, and who aren't getting the protections and don't get the protections in federal law, federal labor law that they deserve. Um, the second thing we need to do is make sure that the federal farm policy actually helps and supports small farmers, not the big agricultural conglomerates that right now are getting huge subsidies from the federal government. Uh, and lastly, I believe we have a real opportunity here with the Green New Deal to actually invest in agriculture and food production in the oceans, which we know can actually be much better for our carbon emissions, use much less landmass because you can go down, and also get us really healthy food uh, to eat that will uh, address our carbon reduction goals. All right, thank you. All right. Um... This next one, as you have very different life experiences regarding money, how do you feel your personal experience will make you a better cho choice to be in the House of Representatives, which involves many budget decisions? Sarah? Yeah, I uh, have experience working in the federal government. I've worked on federal appropriations before at the State Department, figuring out what money went to the State Department versus what went to the Department of Defense. Um, and I think that experience in the federal government makes it incredibly uh, useful to understand all of the different levers that the federal government has to address what we need here in San Diego. I also was uh, Secretary Clinton's representative on the negotiations around the Puerto Rican debt crisis in 2015 and 2016. So I understand what all we can do to address economic crises. Um, and I think that's really important because it's not just the top line issues. There are so many small details that we need uh, to be able to represent us. And we need someone who frankly understands the tax code, who understands the federal government and the appropriations process. And we'll make sure that San Diego gets what we need in that process. Thank you, Georgia. Yes, I mean, District 53rd is uh, a working class district, uh, a people of color district. And, uh, and, and that's why I'm running. And I come from this district. I have lived my entire life in the South Bay, uh, fighting to improve the communities that make up the 53rd. And not only have I been doing it as a community organizer, which is the experience that I bring, and I'm very proud of that, uh, and also my own personal lived experience, but also as the council president, I said earlier that I have changed the conversation in the city of San Diego in really centering equity, really centering better budget decisions that will be impacting the quality of life of low income communities. I changed that agenda in our city. We've been uh, very resistant. That's the type of leadership that I'm gonna bring to Congress to truly center the communities that have been impacted the most, but also uh, build the coalitions that we need to ensure that we are changing the conversation at the federal level for the for the communities. Okay, and then back to Georgia. What economic stimulus plan would you endorse given the economic devastation of the COVID pandemic on the county of San Diego? And would this involve um, increasing taxes? I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that we first need to repeal Trump's taxes that only benefited the wealthy and the corporations. 
So that would be something that we need to do immediately. It has not benefited working families, low-income community members. Uh, so that would be number one. And that would actually create more money for the federal government. And what we do there and how we spend it is going to be the conversation. I really want to go to, uh, to DC to truly fight to prioritize the climate crisis. I mean, right now, under the last budget that was adopted, there's over 70, $700 billion allocated to the Defense Department. We have about, let me see, we have about over, I think over $74 billion to the education. We have in the EPA $9.3 billion HUD, 50 million. Priorities are, are, are critical. These, the other departments outside of the Defense Department need more resources that I'm gonna be fighting for significantly. Thank you. And Sarah? I think that the lesson from 2009 is that we have to get the stimulus right, and we have to have a stimulus package that's big enough and commensurate with the problem that we're facing. I think that what we saw in 2009 is that people were so concerned about the deficit that we did not do a big enough stimulus package, and we ended up having a sluggish recovery. Uh, with really high unemployment, especially affecting millennial workers. And that is actually worse for our long-term debt outlook than actually just passing the kind of stimulus that we need. So I think we need a big two to $3 trillion extra stimulus. Um, I've worked with community leaders to uh, create a small business plan on how we can make sure that small businesses are keeping workers on payroll. And most importantly, in my mind, is $50 billion in investment for childcare because we can never really have an equitable recovery if we don't have a childcare infrastructure in place that helps families and makes childcare jobs good paying jobs. Thank you. All right, um, let's see. What, what electoral reforms would you support regarding the role of money in political campaigns and the Electoral College? Two things at once. Sarah? <laughs> yeah, look, I think that trust in our institutions and our government and frankly, our dysfunction is one of the biggest issues facing our country and the reason we haven't been able to address all of these other issues that so many of us care about. So I support uh, overturning Citizens United. I support publicly financed campaigns. I think we need to do lobbying and ethics reform uh, so that no member of Congress can become a lobbyist when they leave office. We expand the definition of lobbying so more people have to uh, report what they do and they have to report any gift that they ever give. Um, I also think we need to talk about uh, changing the Electoral College, making DC a state and having Puerto Rico have a, a federally sanctioned uh, referendum on statehood and then agreeing to whatever they decide and thinking about what other reforms we can do to make sure that our federal judiciary, for instance, remains as apolitical as the constitution wanted it to be. And honestly, modernizing the way our government interacts with its citizens. Thank you. And Georgia? Yeah, I mean, we, need to first uh, uh, end Citizens United, repeal it. I think that's hurt us and really has created a, a, a really a mess in how elections are, are done and who's influencing them as well. Um, I would also go beyond and, uh, and I think because of, of, uh, of, of us right now currently running, I mean, there, there needs to be a, a restrictions on how one is able to fund their personal campaigns. Um, you know, I'm a strong believer that it's a reflection that if one does the work and you get people to support you uh, to give to your campaign, it's a reflection of people's trust. Um, and it's really unfortunate that this campaign has become um, one that is doing the work and the other one is just writing their personal checks. Um, we also need to ensure that, um, that uh, the electorate college um, is uh, right now silencing communities, voices of color. Um, and we need to address that. And, and uh, DC needs to be a statehood for sure because they're silenced as well. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Georgia, what healthcare policy changes do you support and how can we rein in healthcare costs along with that? Yeah, I mean, right now under, under the COVID, uh, we're seeing the, 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 the fact that we do have a healthcare, uh, a broken system um, by folks 
haven't uh, lost their jobs, they're losing their health care coverage, their family members are losing their health care coverage. So this is the time where we need to prioritize health care and ensure that we're creating a health care for all that it's becoming a, that becomes a human right. It shouldn't be dependent on people's jobs. Um, and that's something that I'm going to be fighting for significantly. But also we need to make sure that Trump gets uh, uh, defeated. Uh, right now, his, um, this administration is trying to overturn ACA. There's a lot of people that are dependent on ACA uh, so to ensure that that's stopped. Um, because if, they, if he wins, uh, we won't have ACA. That's a significant issue for people that are right now dependent on. But outside of that, we need to move to universal health care. Thank you. And Sarah? Yeah, I think healthcare is a human right. And um, I think we can all agree that no kid should die because their family can't afford healthcare. And when you look at countries around the world that have been able to make that transition, most recently Taiwan, I think it's clear that a Medicare for all like system, a single payer system is the most efficient way to get there. Now, I'm glad you asked the question about costs because actually we need to figure out how to bring down cost of healthcare, whether it's the government or the individual at the point of service paying. The United States has the highest healthcare per capita cost of any nation around the world. And to do that, we can bring down pharmaceutical costs by putting caps on drug prices, banning pharmaceutical companies from advertising directly to consumers instead of R&D, fixing our payment system so that we're doing care coordination, we're uh, bundling payments and not just doing fee for service, um, and simplifying the administration to make it easier for the whole system to access the kind of healthcare that they need. Thank you. All right, Sarah, what will be your top international priority if you get to Congress? I think that the most important thing we need to do is rebuild uh, the United States standing after Donald Trump has really decimated it. And honestly, to rebalance our foreign policy so that we're not running it out of the Pentagon, but actually leading with our diplomacy and our development. Um, I worked at the State Department. I probably know one person who still works there because we had such a loss of talent because of the Trump administration's gutting of these institutions. Um, I also think we need to to make sure we're uh, having a leadership role in the world, especially around addressing COVID-19. And we can use the uh, COVID-19 response as a way to create the global governance structures that we're going to need to address other threats like climate change that are uh, beyond uh, individual nations ability to address and making sure that the United States continues to play that kind of leadership role to fix the collective action problem around these kinds of threats like COVID-19 and climate change. Thank you. And Georgia, what would be your top international policy if you get to Congress? Uh, work extremely hard to, uh, to reverse uh, Trump's uh, damage to our global relationship, um, making sure that we're continuing to reconstruct that relationship that will lead to a more positive um, relationship with how we engage with other nations. I think right now that damage has been created and we don't have that. Uh, but once we do that, we really need to talk about what type of uh, relationship we're going to have. I mean, we are, our foreign policy should be centered on the beacon of freedom of those values of democracy. And uh, we don't have that right now in our own country. Uh, so yes, it is critical that we talk about foreign relationships and how we are going to be engaging, but we also need to reflect that type of engagement in our own country and ensure that we're restoring the democracy that we would want to see in other countries as well. Uh, we need to restore funding to the World Health Organization, not be cutting it. Um, and um, we'll Thank you. All right. Um, Georgette, do you support any reforms in the Supreme Court to the Supreme Court? There um, has been some recent uh, public conversations about term limits and expansion. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a firm I'm a firm believer on the whole idea of uh, in, uh, introducing term limits. I think we're seeing it as dangerous if we don't have that, regardless of who's in office. Um, obviously, it's more positive when we have a a true leader that believes in democracy. Uh, but we shouldn't take that chance. So term limits is something that I would support. I support 
uh, the introduction of what Wakana has put forward to achieve term limits is something that I would uh, support when I would get there. I also support making sure that we're creating, expanding the number of judges to ensure that we're balancing the courts. Um, because if we don't have that balance of representation of, ju of judges, then the, the, our democracy, once again, is at stake. So that would be something that I would support. Okay, and Sarah, reforms to the Supreme Court? As I said before, I think trust in our institutions is one of the most important things we need to rebuild. And I, like many of you, have been watching with horror at this uh, confirmation process for Amy Coney Barrett. So I think there are a lot of reforms we'll need to do to maintain the apolitical nature of the Supreme Court, making sure that it's actually able to do what the founders intended it to do. You know, uh, courts don't actually have any enforcement capacity except maybe being able to send federal marshals. So if you don't have trust in that institution, it actually has no power at all. I also, you know, so I support uh, proposals around expanding the number, around term limits, around rotating through the rest of the federal judiciary. But I also think we need to recognize it's not just an issue of the Supreme Court. The entire federal judiciary is moving to a more conservative way. And we need to make sure beyond the Supreme Court, we enact reforms to create the entire federal judiciary to maintain its apolitical nature. Thank you. All right, um, Sarah, what policies regarding the Middle East would you endorse? Well, one minute to solve the Middle East peace <laughs> crisis, no problem at all. Um, there's so much we need to do. Uh, honestly, I think there are two of the most important things we need to do are one, we need to end the forever wars. Uh, I'm of the generation that has never known a day in my adult life that the United States hasn't been at war. Um, and honestly, Susan Davis was in her first year in office when September 11th happened and she was asked to vote on the authorization for the use of military force that is still in effect today and still being used to authorize new military actions today. I also think we need to rejoin the Iran deal. And the second thing I think will be incredibly important is rebuilding our alliances with our European counterparts with others so that when we uh, try and end the forever wars, when we work on the Iran deal, when we work on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we're doing it in concert with our allies around the world, not doing it uh, on our own the way President Trump has done because that's frankly just not effective. Thank you. And Georgia, the Middle East in one minute. <laughs> in one minute, the Middle East, oh my gosh. Uh, I agree. Um, I definitely, I mean, promoting peace above anything else is very critical. I think uh, we really need to be proactive in that. Um, really trying to figure out how we're going to move forward with the relationship of, of uh, Israel and Palestinian co uh, community. Uh, really moving forward to a two-state solution, uh, acknowledging the relationship that we have with Israel and how important they, they are to, to us, but also acknowledging of Palestinian communities. Uh, this, this president took away the aid that we were uh, giving to them. That has to be restored. It can't go one, one way, uh, it can't be one-sided. So we really need to restore that. Uh, we need to uh, renegotiate the Iran deal. That's something that is very critical. It was very unfortunate that Trump uh, pulled us out from that deal that was really essential. And uh, we also need to go back to climate crisis. I think uh, the climate crisis is one of the most essential threats to foreign policy. Thank you. All right, and Georgette, how will you address the massive national debt that now hangs over our country's future and your, especially your generations? Yeah, I mean, yes, it is, it is, it is significant, uh, but I honestly don't believe that this is the time that we need to be pulling back. I mean, we are, our country is going through some serious reckoning. We have a health crisis. We have an economic crisis. We have more poverty and families are living under these conditions that they're having a difficult time surviving. This is not the time where we need to pull back and say, hey, we're gonna now make this a priority while people are hurting, uh, they're dying. So this is where we need to be bolder and uh, allocate more resources. Um, I would you know, continue doing that, it's very critical, but also we'll start with going back, Trump's taxes are very significant and we need to repeal them. 
It only benefited the corporation and it benefited the wealthy and that has to be redone. Okay, and thank you. And Sarah? Yeah, I'm a millennial, so I'm uh, very sympathetic to the idea that it's my generation who's going to be having to pay this off. Um, but I believe that the lesson of 2009 is that we have to focus on the kind of stimulus we need now and focus on the deficit later, or else what is going to happen is we're going to have decades of slow growth and low productivity, which will be worse for the deficit in the long term because of the decreased tax base. Um, I think we need to repeal the Republican tax bill that increased the deficit without doing anything to help middle class families. Uh, I think corporations need to be taxed more. I need to be taxed more. My family needs needs to be taxed more. Um, and I think we need to focus not only on the deficit number, but what we're spending money on, because any business person will tell you that they'll take a CapEx investment as long as it grows their business down the road. Um, my real nightmare scenario is that we don't do what we need right now. And the sluggish recovery triggers the United States to lose its special status as a go-to safe asset, which is what will actually trigger a debt crisis, not the deficit number. Okay, thank you. All right, and this may be our last question um, before your closing remarks. So Sarah, what um, most distinguishes you from your opponent in terms of your political philosophy and experience? In talking to voters across the district, I think it's clear that what they're looking for is someone who has the kind of experience that I have working in the federal government, who has made and implemented public policy at the federal level and will really be able to hit the ground running on day one, has thought deeply about the domestic and international issues that we'll be facing and who will be a new generation of leaders who understands that the only way to get anything done anywhere, but especially in Washington, is by building coalitions of people who don't necessarily agree on everything, but who agree on one issue and can move that forward. And that's what I've done my entire career, whether it was literally working in international diplomacy at the State Department, working at UNICEF with technology companies to better serve vulnerable children around the world, or right now with San Diego for Every Child, where we've brought a huge diversity of groups together to make sure that we are taking care of San Diego's children, child care and equitable distance learning during this crisis that we're all facing. Okay, thank you. And Georgia, what distinguishes you from your opponent? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, Voters want to see uh, elected that have leadership and that have a proven record of actually being a public um, policymaker and uh, serving as a council member, serving as the council president, having been the former chair of MTS and being part of our regional CNDEC board really has given me the opportunity to show that and demonstrate that I'm able to move forward on policies that are impacting um, you know, the communities that are continuing to suffer. This country is uh, it's, uh, it's, it's within the state of, of disruption. Um, income inequality is uh, greater than what, what we saw before. There's a racial disparities uh, that are you know, highlighted by COVID. And uh, not only do I have the leadership of being a an elected that has worked with both Republicans and Democrats, which is what people want to see in Congress. I also have the lived experience, which is critical to ensure that we're moving forward in policies that are addressing the current needs. Thank you. All right, and now before our candidates give our, their closing remarks, I want to thank all of the audience for um, attending and listening to and asking such great questions. Um, hopefully you're all registered to vote. Today was the last day to register online. However, you can, um, if there is someone who hasn't registered to vote out there, it seems like everyone has, um, you can still do it up to election day um, at the Registrar of Voters. Um, you can check your registration at sdvote.com and uh, also follow your ballot to see where it goes. So also, um, and the league, is, is pleased to help everyone get better informed and become a more informed voter. And um, especially these are very critical issues we are dealing with and both of you candidates have answered their questions remarkably. So um, with that, I wanna thank you both and let's go with the um, closing remarks. And we started with Georgette, so let's start with Sarah. 
Well, thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk with both of us today. Um, my background's in policy, so I've really enjoyed the opportunity to take a deep dive on so many of the issues that we'll be working on in the next Congress. And I really do believe that the 117th Congress is going to be almost entirely focused on COVID-19 recovery. And my focus will be on making sure that assistance gets to those who need it most, to our families, our small businesses. And we're gonna need a member of Congress who spends two years getting more than just their sea legs. What I can promise you is that I've thought deeply about both the domestic and international issues that will be facing Congress. And what I also want to say is that I'm very grateful for everything that San Diego has given to me and my family, and I'm incredibly proud of the campaign we've built. I would never ask someone to invest in something I wasn't willing to invest in myself. But having the resources to communicate doesn't mean anything if you don't have a message and a candidate that resonates with voters. Otherwise, Mike Bloomberg would be our Democratic presidential nominee right now. And I'm really proud of the way we spend our money on our campaign. We pay our staff a living wage. We have a paid internship program. We've hired formerly homeless youth, formerly incarcerated youth. Uh, and we give opportunities to young people who otherwise wouldn't have them to get into the political space. And not being beholden to donors also means I don't have, I have the benefit of being independent. I'm not beholden to lobbyists or special interests. I will only be beholden to the people of this district and I'll do what we need to do to get us out of this crisis. I just wanna say on a personal note that I know this year has been a lot to handle. We're still grappling with COVID, with the Supreme Court nomination, with the economic fallout and things feel really difficult and dark right now. But I've seen firsthand what's possible when San Diegans have a big idea and work together to get it done. And I know that together we can elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and turn a new page and elect a new generation of leaders and build the future we all deserve. So thank you all again so much. And I'd be honored to have your support. Thank you. And Georgia? Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in and staying with us. I mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate um, having me be part of this very critical conversation. Um, America is being challenged in 2020 by a global pandemic uh, induced by climate change, a shattering recession, and a reckoning of race and justice. We've learned once again that elections have consequences and having elected leaders with a proven record of leadership and getting things done can make the difference between someone's life. As president of the San Diego City Council, I've worked to, uh, to expand affordable housing to strengthen protections for low-income residents. I led the implementation of our city's climate action plan, and I have delivered millions of dollars to fund community projects. I have fought discrimination, established the race and equity department, cracked down on housing discrimination, banned dangerous chokeholds by police, and led the effort an independent commission on police practices that will lead to transparency and accountability. I have delivered results and will bring this type of leadership in Congress. That's why I'm very proud to have been endorsed by Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Alexandria Castro Cortez, the Democratic Party, Tony Atkins, Dr. Shirley Weber, and many more, many more. I have taken on Trump's dangerous agenda and special interests who prioritize big corporations over the health of San Diego families. I have taken big polluters and threatened the climate crisis and health, and I have taken the fast action in providing relief for San Diego families. This is the type of leadership that I will bring to Congress, and I will be very honored to earn your support. Thank you so much. Thank you both. And on behalf of the Bankers Hill Community Group and the League of Women Voters, I want to thank both of the candidates for running for office and attending our forum. And um, thank you for all the attendees and for following the League motto, don't be just a voter, be an informed voter. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.